Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome our guest, Jakub Nešetřil, who is joining us live from Silicon Valley. Jakub is founder of a company called Apiary. Their dream is to unify the APIs on, of the internet applications, make the applications more productive. And also Jakub will share his experience from startup companies and will tell us why startup companies have chance to succeed even against much bigger and stronger firm. So it's my great pleasure to invite Jakub, and Jakub, it's, it's up to you now. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me? Can you just move or do something? I, yes, thank you. Somebody's not sleeping in the audience. Um, if you want, feel free to move periodically, because it, make, it, it gives me a feedback that uh, the connection between uh, West Coast and Prague is still working and uh, we haven't frozen somewhere in the middle of the internet. Um, thank you for coming. I know it's early morning for you, so probably everybody is sleeping. Um, I am also sleeping uh, because it's midnight here, so I will finish at 2 a.m. Um, so please have patience with me if I'm a little bit too tired. Um, good. Um, so with that uh, away, um, I'd like to talk about uh, mostly about why I think startups can succeed in international competition uh, and uh, why even smaller companies can kind of take on big uh, established giants. Um, but I also wanted to answer some other questions that I frequently hear from people when they talk to me about startups. Uh, um, why do so many companies fail? Is it not just a, a strange exercise in futility? Uh, why do you need to raise investor money? Uh, are startups perhaps not just burning money away? And, uh, um, and also uh, touch a little bit on when does it make sense to start a local company versus uh, a global company. Um, and before I do that, um, very quick introduction uh, to me. Um, I am nobody special. I studied computer science in Brno, like you study now in, in Prague. Um, I worked a couple of years after that in, in IT in New Zealand. I did some websites and some custom programming and I traveled for a few years, like perhaps you might after you finish school. Uh, and then when I came back to Prague, I, I really more by pure luck than anything else uh, I joined the company that was called Good Data. I was founded that year and I was the first employee. It was a company by Roman Staniek. Uh, we did several uh, internet startups before that, actually, I think even from Jera with I did one. Uh, and so I joined the company when it was two founders in Prague and me. And um, over the next three years, I, I helped them to build the company. And I, I, see it, I saw it kind of grow from five people to 50 people to 200 people. Uh, and that was a pretty amazing experience. And I worked also at Good Data at... Uh, helping them with the API uh, rollout and with a partner strategy uh, that they were implementing. And after that, when I uh, felt like it was time to leave, um, I decided to find a, found Apiary, which is a company that focuses on APIs. Um, and uh, initially, when we started that, we got early on accepted to a Cambridge uh, University run accelerator. Uh, I think it was like the first company from Czech Republic that, that managed to get to a, a kind of reputable outside accelerator. So we were very excited about that. We had about 1,000 companies in the competition and, and, and we managed to kind of get accepted there. Um, and after we came back from the accelerator, we were kind of just hanging around uh, in, in co-working places and working at Starbucks or anywhere else that had Wi-Fi and a chair. And uh, um, three years later, uh, we have a great company that I'm really proud of. We have offices in Prague and San Francisco. We have 13,000 companies that are using our products um, all over the world, really like 145 countries or something like that. Um, and we've got great companies like Akamai or Nike or Walt Disney that are working with us. Of course, most importantly for me, we also have South Park Studios, which I'm really excited about. So API for uh, South Park episodes is, uh, is built using our tools. And we were the startup of the year last year, at least according to Krzysztof Alupa, uh, depending on whether you follow that or not. 
Um, and, and really all of that we, we did only with 12 people. And so that'll be one of the uh, reasons why I want to talk about why startups can succeed uh, is uh, uh, that we really have just a few people and we're taking up companies that are uh, several orders of magnitude bigger than we are. Um, yeah, so, and, and by the way, that's a quick introduction. Uh, if you have any questions during the, uh, the presentation, uh, please ask. Um, I will probably not have content to fill all of the 90 minutes, so it, you will do me a great favor if you, if you interrupt me. Uh, and uh, if not, then we can have questions and answer some discussion afterwards. Good. Um, so first discussion, what, what, what makes me think that um, we can compete with uh, international giants? Uh, there was actually a question that when I started first in Good Data, when I, uh, it was my first day there, in fact, I was actually interviewing in Good Data. And the first thing that I asked Roman was, how the hell do you think that building a business intelligence analytics product is something you can do from Prague and that you, that Oracle or MicroStrategy or IBM or one of those huge companies will not uh, outperform you. They have got several thousand developers and you, you, you don't have any developers right now. And, uh, and what he told me uh, was my first lesson in startup life and, and, and something that is very interesting, I think. The, the best products, or, or rather the, the companies that succeed in disrupting uh, established large players um, don't succeed because they have a better product. And they don't succeed because they have a better idea. Um, they succeed sense to something that's called startup dilemma or, or innovation innovators dilemma uh, which is really a situation where the disrupting products coming into a market is almost always inferior it's always worse in in many different uh, areas but it has to have that like one thing that it does fundamentally different and as it keeps growing and as it keeps uh, improving it it overtakes the existing established players and the dynamic around it is when it starts out initially, uh, all of the existing players are very basically ridiculing it, saying, you know, this is this is a toy, this is something that is useless, that uh, is lacking many many features that we have for years, and it's not powerful enough, and it's not quick enough, and it only applies to small companies, and all of those things are true, um, and uh, and the product starts with customers that. Pay, pay very little money for it, and that. but nevertheless, it has something fundamentally different to it. And then, as it keeps growing, um, the established players are progressively more ridiculing it. And when they start getting more serious about looking into those competitors, um, it's usually already too late. Um, but I think that the, the, the best way to understand this is to think about having an established product and established company and thinking about your revenue for the company, that's thinking about your income, where, where your money comes from. It's very, very hard if you have, if you're Microsoft and you're making all your money on Microsoft Office to introduce a competing product with Microsoft Office because that will destroy your profit margins, it will destroy your revenue, your, 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 a lot of your existing customers will hate you because they will tell you, we invested all of our future in Microsoft Office uh, and now you're competing with your own products. So it's very, very hard for them to, to compete with their own internal products and by the time they realize that it's inevitable that there's something else overtaking their, their product, it's usually uh, already too late to do anything about it. So that's a, that's a kind of innovator's dilemma the dilemma of uh, um, maintaining your existing products uh, versus competing with them with inferior products that are somehow different. And it's very hard to do inside large companies uh, and that's really a driving motor for uh, why a lot of small companies, international companies, even from Czech Republic, can succeed in uh, really overtaking uh, and competing with very large players. Good. No questions. Uh, I'll keep moving. Um, another question that I often hear is, uh, 
Um, most of those startups are completely useless. I mean, is, this is this is something where 99% you know, of the companies will never make any profit, and uh, it's just a sexy, cool thing that everybody does today. And, and it's really just a fad. It's a vanity. And uh, um, I, I would like to do something serious. And I think that's a misunderstanding of what uh, what innovation looks like. Um, one favorite saying uh, of mine is that all the pioneers that when they were conquering the Wild West in America and they were kind of moving from east to west and they were fighting for territory with the Indians, all the pioneers that were leading the charge always ended up with their arrows in the backs. Uh, they were the ones that were shot first because they were plowing through the way. Um, and uh, so of course by nature if you're trying to do something original uh, most of the time you're going to fail because it was either a bad idea or it was a great idea but it was bad timing or it was a great idea and great timing but something else didn't work out you didn't communicate the idea correctly you didn't hire the correct team you didn't find the correct people to work with um, there's many different reasons why uh, uh, a startup can fail but I think uh, it's important to understand that if a startup fails it's okay as long as the attempt to create something honestly new was 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 real as long as there was real honest attempt to create something new if you're uh, running a startup to be cool and to be uh, getting money from investors and sitting in a uh, cool co-working space somewhere then this is really a vanity that's a, that's a, that's just a pretense uh, but if, if there's a real kind of honest driving need to fix a problem, then if you if you fail, um, that's okay as, as you tried hard enough. Um, a, a different approach, and probably uh, to a similar different question to a similar uh, similar sentiment underneath is why do startups need funding at all? Um, why should you be um, taking money from investors, why is it important to take money from investors, why, if a company is successful, if it's, if it's a good idea, that, 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 uh, then surely it should be able to make money for its own uh, expansion and for its own growth and, uh, and fueling companies with some external investment is an artificial way how to inflate them uh, quickly. And there is a little bit to that, of course, there, were, there was a time uh, for example, around 2000s, just before the dot-com crash, and some people argue that even today there is such a time when um, there was such an availability of capital, such an availability of investors that would be funding new ideas, um, that uh, there was an explosion of startups that were that were really just uh, growing much more quickly than they should be because uh, the idea wasn't validated, it wasn't proven that there is a good idea, and they were just growing artificially. But that being said, uh, there's several reasons why it's a good idea to, uh, to fund your startup from, uh, uh, from external investors. W one of them is that certain ideas and certain products require a critical mass before they're interesting. Um, if you're building a product, networking is probably a good example. If you're or, or, or kind of analytical products as well. Uh, if you're building a product that only works from a certain s amount of customers up, then if you're trying to self-fund yourself to the first uh, 100,000 or million users that are going to use your product, that's a very hard way uh, to go about doing things. Um, the other way to think about it is if you're competing in a space where everybody else is taking investment money, and as a result of that, um, can grow much quicker and can hire uh, uh, employers much, employees much quicker, build products much quicker, then it's really rare that you can compete in such a situation without uh, accepting uh, external funding. Uh, one of the ways uh, you could compare this to is, is Tour de France. Uh, you know, if, if funding is, uh, is, your, is your drug, uh, is your uh, uh, performance booster, then um, if everybody else is uh, injecting, you also have to be injecting. Um, and uh, if, you, if you decide not to, 
And if you decide that you just want to build your company slow, then you better hope that nobody wants to compete with you. Uh, but that rarely happens. Usually, if, if you have a good idea, other people will try to copy it. If they don't, there's <laughs> you probably don't have such a good idea. Uh, it's a, it's a, um, one of the pitfalls uh, when you're trying to convince somebody that you have a great uh, uh, product idea, that you have a great startup, is to say, my idea is completely unique. Nobody else in the world is doing it. Um, if nobody else in the world is doing it, it probably means it's not a good idea. Uh, otherwise, somebody would already be copying it. And of course, uh, even with what APR does, which is a very narrowly focused product that's very technical, for a lot of people it's hard to understand, it's questionable whether there's market for it. Even in that space, in the last two years since we started uh, kind of publicly shipping our product, we have at least six competitors that are copying us. Some of them copy everything we do, literally. If we say A, two months later they say A. If we introduce B, two months later they introduce B. That's fine. We will, comp we will uh, beat them anyway. But uh, it's hard to do if uh, one of the sites um, is, uh, is injecting and the other one is not. The other way to think about um, kind of startups and venture capital in, in general is it's a little bit like uh, the Normandy invasion. You know, you, you land on the beach and the first 10 rows will fall under enemy bullets. But even if just one of the soldiers makes it through and delivers a grenade somewhere over the barricades, then, uh, then the mission is done. And uh, for a venture capital investor, when they're investing into technology startups specifically, uh, the expectation is already built into the model that a lot of these startups will fail. Uh, in fact, that a majority of the startups will fail. Um, but the return and the way the dynamic works is if there's something truly successful and truly unique, then it completely um, makes up for all the losses that the other nine, or actually more probably more like 95% of the, of the invested startups, that the, all the money that is burned on everybody else not being successful is more than aptly replaced by the one or two or three winners that, that managed to actually build uh, global, big, successful businesses. Good, so um, that, was, uh, that was the second approach, kind of why venture capital works. And I'm ha happy to talk about it more when you have some questions around that. But uh, uh, I just wanted to explain some of the core points of uh, why startup space is often very difficult to understand for people that look at it as just another uh, small company, just another company that, that you know, like if you open a shop on the corner, it's either profitable or it's not profitable. But uh, uh, if you're trying to create innovation, if you're trying to create something new, um, then uh, the question whether something can be profitable in the long term is often impossible to answer in the first six months, for example. Good. Um, another often um, discussed question is, uh, should I build a local business or should I build a global business? And uh, it, I think it particularly in Prague, this is a hotly contested problem. Um, um, uh, some people are saying that uh, global startups is the only way to go and local startups are completely uh, um, worthless and other people are saying, well, at least we're profitable and not burning money like other investors. Um, I think the way to look at this is that some businesses you can build locally and some businesses you have to go globally. And uh, there's a famous kind of Fermi problem or Fermi post this kind of approach to very quick modeling of thinking about uh, difficult problems and their sizes. Uh, Problem, uh, Fermi had this approach, this, this question of how many professional piano tuners are in Chicago? And that's something that's really hard to answer and uh, it's one of those trick questions if you're doing uh, in job interviews for one of the famous tech companies or at least used to be. And uh, um, 
the thinking behind it is that you should you should start kind of critically thinking about what is the number of people in Chicago, and, uh, what are the number of households on the top of those people, uh, how many of those households can have pianos, and how many of those pianos need tuning, and how frequently, and, and then you kind of work your way back through to uh, a rough approximate of um, the number of tuners in Chicago. And the point is that you don't need to get it right. Um, you can even get it wrong by a multiple. Uh, that doesn't matter. But you usually get the order of magnitude right uh, if you if you make all the estimates along the way correctly. And uh, the number one thing that you have to think about when you're creating a new company, when you're creating a new product, is what is your what's called total addressable market size. Uh, what is the total number of people that could buy your product and, and, and how much would they buy it for? And that's very, very difficult to, to uh, estimate when you're creating API tools that nobody has ever seen and you don't know how many APIs are out there in the world and how many developers are out there and what is the price they would like to pay for. But you can get some sense for order of magnitudes. And uh, I've very frequently seen people come up with a good idea that is very well intentioned, but it's never going to work if it's only going to be done in the scope of Czech Republic. Just because if there's, I've been mentoring a startup recently and they were trying to do a social network for uh, child minders or babysitters. And uh, if you start working your way to those 10 million people and for 10 million people, it's maybe 1 million babies order of magnitude, or maybe it's half a million babies and uh, that, that need to babysitters. And uh, for, for half a million babies, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, how many babysitters and, and, and how many of them uh, can you actually get to be using your application and, what's the, what, and how, how much can you make money on it? And if you, if you start working way down like this, you very quickly figure out that this can never reach uh, a business of any uh, uh, interest in size. On the other hand, if it was operating in a market that has 300 million people and not 10 million people, then that might be a completely different story. And so actually, I think um, the core reason why a lot of startups go to America is, uh, is not because Maybe there was a historical reason with Silicon Valley and with a lot of the technology industry here. But nowadays, the biggest reason for it is because it's the biggest market uh, that behaves consistently. This, the, the European market is, of course, much bigger. Well, not much bigger, but it is somewhat bigger. But it's very fractured. Every country speaks a different language. Every country has a different legal system. Every country has different cultural expectations. Um, so you can't build one product and uh, expect it to, to be used by the whole market. Um, America is a much, much bigger market in, in the sense of that it's very consistent. And the other thing about big markets is that if you have a niche small product that, and that's usually when you, where, you, where it's easiest to, to find some innovation. Sometimes once every five, 10 years, somebody comes up with a really massive idea that influences everybody, like uh, Facebook or Twitter or the, the whole approach of it or many other things. But I'm not as, you know, I'm not such a genius as other people are. Uh, I, I am happy with my small innovation for something that I can change for you know, not 10 billion people, not 1 billion people, not 100 million people, but even if I influence 1 million people, uh, that are willing to pay for something, that, that, that's good enough. But for that kind of mechanics, for the very niche product that's very tightly focused, you have to be operating on a big market. So APR could never work if it was, uh, if it started as a local company and then kind of was working its, its way up. And in fact, the other problem with starting a local company, the, the, the other thing that people tell me is, okay, I understand that I need to make this a global product I understand that I need to be operating globally because otherwise it will never be a large enough company. But let me start here in Prague and then I'll, if it works, I'll expand to the Czech Republic and if it works, I'll expand to Germany and, 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 and then I'll work my way from there. And that's, that's a good valid approach if you need geographical density for something. 
For example, if you're um, if you're making food delivery, then you can't start a global company that's making food delivery all around the world because you need to hire trucks and drivers that deliver food somewhere. And so, starting in a small localized place, validating the model, and then kind of growing makes a lot of sense. But for a lot of technological startups, uh, and especially kind of product startups, if you build it to match um, the Czech market, then you build something into the product that you end, that will end up being very difficult to uh, redevelop uh, when you start targeting uh, international markets. Uh, and it's not just the language, it's not just that you build something with Czech user interface, but it's really more about you build a company and you build a product that expects certain user behavior, that expects customers and users to behave certain ways, and and usually that end up, ends up being uh, quite different uh, internationally, even for such things as uh, software developers. Um, software developers in Prague are way more technical, uh, they're, they're, they're way less kind of marketing influenceable, for example, um, and uh, internationally it's different. And so if you build a product that's working in Czech Republic, that doesn't necessarily mean it, 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 it will have to, it will work successfully uh, somewhere else. Good, so I am about halfway through, more than halfway through. I, uh, that was kind of some of the questions that I wanted to talk about on the startup side. Um, I have some small private notes on um, what it was like when we were building uh, good data as a company and what it is like now when we're building apiary as a company and what are the differences between those two, uh, which I think illustrate some uh, interesting aspects on how companies differ uh, one from another um, and how, how kind of building a technology startup, because both of them are very heavily uh, based on technology, how, how it differs from company to company. Um, after that, I'm really open to questions. I have some small more remarks if you want to hear them, but, uh, but that's it. Good, so uh, good data versus apiary and um, the early days. Um, the one thing that really surprised me in both of the companies is, and it's something that has to be seen to be believed, is how much the first several people that joined the company and several customers that you get initially, how much they define the whole business. Um, if you start taking certain things for granted initially at the start, then that just completely changes the business and it's very, very hard to uh, root that out of the system uh, afterwards. So um, I still remember to this day our first uh, customer in good data, um, it was a company from East Coast called Gazelle, uh, which was uh, um, buying used electronics and, and, and uh, polishing it and cleaning it up and reselling it. Uh, and it, it wasn't that exciting, but it was interesting. It, it had some ecological aspect to it. Uh, it's like, like, hooray, people are not throwing things away. They can kind of uh, repurpose them and sell them to somebody else. Uh, but uh, they very, very much shaped the company for several years, actually. Because the way that, that they were asking us for features, the way that they were approaching the product. Um, and that's really something that's, that was very surprising to me. Uh, I know that culture is something that's a, or at least culture in a company is something that for me, before I did this, was something that I couldn't even imagine what you mean. Like, does it mean that we go to pop after, after, after we're finished, you know, or that, that nobody works hard or, um, but um, it's, it's really the little things. It's, uh, it's um, how you talk to people, how you talk to your customers, whether your thoughts are, oh, it, it, that this customer doesn't understand me, whatever, I will just find another customer. Or if you're thinking, oh, this is interesting, well, I wonder why they don't like my product. Uh, all of these little things, how you, how you communicate with them, how you talk, uh, really influence hugely um, what the company looks like three years down the road. The other thing that was very much different um, was it's very much about who you're building a product for. Um, 
in good data, eventually we realized that to oversimplify things, um, the target customer is a CFO, uh, chief financial officer, and um, or perhaps somebody who's in that role uh, in a smaller department inside the company. So somebody who likes who likes to see metrics, who likes to understand um, um, where they're spending money or where they're spending time, uh, when they're spending people, or you know, somebody who needs to measure the company. Uh, the target customer for Apiary is a CTO, which is really somebody who's a developer or was a developer and now is kind of heading up developers and heading up architecture. And that's oversimplification, of course. It's, uh, it's, but that really defines very much not just who you're trying to sell to, but how the product works and how the product looks and how the company works internally and how you can afford to do business. And one specific way that uh, that uh, is sometimes talked about is a top-down versus bottom-up approach to uh, selling a product, uh, selling a technology product. A top-down approach means that you try to find large companies that would be interested in your product and then you individually approach them and you typically approach them at a very high level. You try to speak to the CEO, you try to speak to the CFO, to the CTO, um, you, you meet them at some conferences or some product, some technology industry events or you know, you, you play golf with them in the worst case scenarios, <laughs> you invite them for dinners. And, and uh, you have these very kind of expensive lengthy process where you're explaining them how you're going to help their company and what your strategy is and why they should buy your product. And then you sell like one product, one license for 1 million US dollars or something very, very large. Because you have to sell uh, for a very large number because it takes a lot of time and a lot of work um, to get that customer to, to to explain to them why how your product works, and it's very valid, and it's 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 a good way to be uh, to be building companies for certain markets and for certain segments. The complete opposite is a bottom-up product, uh, which a lot of you as developers are much more familiar with. Which is, uh, I build something that is free; it's super easy to use. Everybody uses it. Uh, people pick it up spontaneously. And eventually, I'm trying to build my way up through the hierarchy inside of the company, somewhere where somebody will actually decide that they will give me some money. Uh, and the canonical example in, uh, in software development, for example, for that is GitHub. Uh, GitHub is a software versioning tool. Uh, probably all of you use it and know it. And uh, at the same time, pretty much everybody in the world is using it for free. But eventually, they come into companies where they also need to version their software, and they start looking at well, maybe we need some advanced features. And so, the kind of rank and file common developers start recommending that solution to their uh, team leaders and to their kind of managers. And then eventually, it gets somewhere where somebody can make a uh, decision to buy and to spend money. Uh, so that's a bottom-up approach, and uh, those two very much differ, and they completely change the way that you have to build a product. If, for example, not just if you do a bottom-up product that it has to be simple enough so that people start using it and it has to have a free component, but if you build a top-down product and it's self-service, people don't like it. If, if, you, if there's a certain expectations attached to it. If, if you sell somebody a product for 100,000 US dollars, then they expect that you will come and deliver it in a box and deliver a manual and do, you know, uh, do a, a, a company training and there's, there's associated expectations with it. And uh, nobody just expects to spend uh, you know, 2 million check crowns, 100,000 US dollars, and just get some software that they will install themselves and it just kind of works out of the box and they will have to take care of it on their own. And so the, the, the approach on how you, who you sell to and how you sell to, it really defines very much Good. So um, a little bit um, short discussion around why we're building Apiary and why we think this is really um, something very fundamental. That uh, it's not just a global company, but it's an important company, and this is a huge opportunity. For that. I'll start with a couple quotes that some of you might know. 
Uh, and if so, I apologize that you're allergic to them, but um, Software is Eating the World is a very famous essay uh, by Mark Andreessen, the, the guy who built Netscape in the 90s and now is a very successful venture capital investor in Silicon Valley. And it really summarizes the approach that if you look around yourself today, then increasingly more and more of your life is defined by software. Initially, it was just the email and the websites, and now it's uh, um, the planning of the, of, the, of the lecture room that you're sitting in, and uh, all of the information system on the university, and all of the data that you're getting when you're, when you're when you're learning and all of the communication with your parents and all of the shopping that you do in the local shop and uh, you know increasingly things around you like your watch or you know, the TV or, or, or radio or newspapers. Newspapers are an excellent example how they're completely destroyed by the by software. And so if you look at the writing on the wall um, more and more of traditional businesses and of traditional companies are going to be converted into something that's essentially software or software assisted traditional businesses and actually one very hot area right now is software for agriculture for example for farmers and uh, for growing uh, plants uh, that's a hugely exploding area now so not it's not just a traditional kind of uh, things that you run on your computer that get affected by software, but pretty much every area of life, every profession, every industry is getting changed by software. And the other part to it is that um, we're not just in a world where software means something that runs on your desktop computer, um, and it's not just your desktop computer or cell phone anymore. And it's not just your desktop computer or cell phone or the internet server up there, or like a cloud, we call it. Initially, increasingly more and more, it's, it's many, many different devices everywhere. It's uh, the, the small app on your phone and the phone thing on your tablet, but perhaps something that will be on your watch eventually and something that lives in your TV because it streams Netflix or it streams from the, another server, your, your TV shows and, and something that lives somewhere else. And all of these different hardware platforms and all of these different software platforms need to talk to each other. And uh, that's really where APIs come in. And that's why we feel, feel it's not just something that is uh, popular in 2013 or 2014, but something that is increasingly going to be super important across um, all industries uh, and everything that people do, because APIs are things that connect uh, software together. Uh, and our mission is like the motto, the thing that we're trying to do is to just make building APIs and owning APIs. So the whole process, not just building something, but then maintaining it and servicing it and helping people and, and changing it, making all of that easy. And I know it's a very generic sentence and I don't want to get into discussions about what exactly we do, because if you're interested, you can look it up yourself. But this is our kind of motto of why we build Apiary and, and, and where we're going with it. And we're building products that are sold bottom up. So they have to be self service, they have to be simple, they are no nonsense. Um, and we, we're doing something, we're operating in something that uh, people call um, B2D, uh, kind of business to developer. Um, and that's a, that's, a, that's, a, um, that's a play on two traditional kind of divisions on, on how software market looks like um, or how, how, how market general kind of uh, business approach looks like. It, that's a B2B, which is business to business, and B2C, which is business to consumer. A B2C, business to consumer, the prototype of that would be something like, um, I don't know, YouTube, right? Uh, you make no money on it. Uh, it costs a ridiculous amount of money to support it but it gets uh, 100 million or 1 billion people that, that are actually looking at it. Uh, B2B, business to business, means uh, often, usually it means uh, um, I have a few hundred customers, each one of them is paying me a ridiculous amount of money and it takes me half a year to get a new customer. Uh, and I'm so oversimplifying, but I'm trying to make a point of how the two areas, business to business and business to consumer, how they differ. And business to developer 
is really a very interesting market because it's kind of in the crossover. And it's not a new market if you think about uh, some software tools that you're happy with and that are popular. Like for example, MySQL would be a very good one from the, from the 2000s, uh, from the era past. Um, or Red Hat is, 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 a, is a currently very successful company, or even GitHub actually is a, is, a, is a good company. All of these are operating in the kind of business to developer market. And what that means is that it has some of the attributes of business to consumer, and it has some of the attributes of business to business. It's somewhere in the middle. And uh, the unique things about it uh, from business to consumer is that it's often a product that anybody can download or install or use. And, uh, and so it spreads very virally. It spreads like word of mouth. People, one person tells the other, they introduce it to each other. Um, you don't typically have to do a massive amount of marketing. You don't buy billboards and television advertising or anything like that. Also because it doesn't make sense because your product is very narrow and focused. So if you blast something through television, 99% of people are not going to understand what you talk about. But, but you're building something that grows um, when it comes to the number of people using your product, it grows very organically on its own. Um, and yet, and that's a typical thing for business to consumer, that, that, that if you make things sexy enough and if you make things attractive enough and if they're good enough, then somehow uh, the growth will take care of itself. It's oversimplification, but it often looks like that. You don't have to hire salespeople that sit on telephones and are calling people and saying, please use my product. That, that, that's not how business to consumer works. And that's not how business to developer works either. But on the other hand, business to consumer is, for, for example, another example, Google, you know, you make $1 off every customer that you have, or you make one ten cents of every customer that you have because you show him advertising or like, like Facebook does. Uh, so you have a huge amount of people that are using you, uh, but you make very little money off them. And in the business to developer market, the interesting uh, difference to it is that you're never going to have 10 million users or 100 million users because there's only about 10 million developers in the world altogether. And quite probably most of them are not going to use your product, whatever. But even if you get 50,000 developers, 100,000 developers, 200,000 developers, I think 100, 200 is a, is a typical number uh, for very, very successful products. Um, if you get to that number, and of course, that's 200,000 people that are not paying you, that are just using your tools for free, you're likely going to be able to convert 2, 3, 5% of them into paying plans. And those paying plans are several orders of magnitude higher than anything that can Facebook or, you know, or, or any of the uh, business to consumer applications can do. You're not going to get $1 from a customer. You're not going to get $10 from a customer. You're going to get $100 from a customer or $1,000 or often even $10,000. Uh, and so it's a very interesting market in that it has the dynamic of building something that is sexy, that is, that is uh, easy, that, that people like using. And at the same time, if, if you get it right, you can make a lot of money on, on the kind of more business-oriented or more, uh, more enterprise-oriented functions. And it's a, it's a balancing act of um, making sure that uh, while pursuing one, you don't destroy the other. Um, and again, all of the companies that I mentioned, GitHub, MySQL, Red Hat, all of them are good examples of how finally you have to balance. If, uh, uh, if MySQL decided, and they did in, at one point, that uh, the free database that's open source is going to be somehow crippled and only their paid enterprise database is going to be feature rich, then there's a huge backlash and people will start using other tools and then eventually MySQL will be replaced by something else, which it actually is getting. But um, at the same time, if you decide that you make your free product powerful and that it will have everything, then you're kind of removing the incentive for people to actually start converting into some paying programs that you're offering. So it's a very much a balancing act, delicate balancing act between those two. And for us at Apiary, we try to build things that people can use everywhere for free. And then we think about features 
that are uniquely interesting only to larger companies. We, for example, think if you're a uh, if you're a hacker, if you're a developer, if you're a small team, uh, you don't really care as much about putting a logo somewhere on your API documentation because you probably don't have a logo and we don't care. But if you're a large company, you have all these branding needs and you need to stay kind of in brand. And so we offer uh, some premium plans for companies that uh, need to have branding on their API documentation. And it works really well. It doesn't alienate the normal developers, and uh, it allows us to charge money to large companies that are in it. So that's a just very quick explanation of what business to developer is and uh, the interesting kind of uh, balances between uh, offering something for free and, and charging for it at the same time. The, the other thing uh, that uh, I think is typical for us and that's different uh, from uh, Good Data and from a lot of other companies that I work that is because we're so developer focused, not just that we like developers, but we build software that other developers use. And so if we sell to somebody, it's typically to developers or to development managers or to CTOs. Um, and if we get a support requests, they're very technical and we need to have somebody that I can actually answer them correctly. Um, we've done away with all the traditional infrastructure and kind of hierarchy that's inside normal startups or inside normal companies typically. Uh, typically, in good data, that's certainly the case, but it's in many companies you have um, senior management and then you have product managers, product managers or product owners um, kind of talk to customers and try to find out what they need and, uh, and, and what you should probably build. And then they kind of distill that into some, into some plan and they tell developers what to build and developers then build it. And then there is a quality assurance team that tests and makes sure that everything works correctly. And once that's done, things get deployed to servers if you have servers. And then there's an operation team that, that takes care of servers and makes sure that things are running and, uh, and uh, mitigates any disasters if, if, if something keeps crashing. And, um, in Apiary, we have none of that. We have just developers. And our developers decide what they want to build. Uh, our developers talk to our customers. Uh, our developers build things. And then they, uh, then they deploy them to our servers. And then they write a blog post about them. And then they go to conferences to talk about them. And eventually, they might even actually sell it to uh, somebody if, if, it's, if, if, if somebody actually wants to buy some of our premium features. Um, but it's, it's the whole thing. It's uh, yeah, from all the way from deciding what we have to build, uh, all the way to supporting it and answering customer questions and uh, describing it and writing blog posts about it. And in a certain way, almost marketing, going to conferences and talking. Um, and that means because we don't have kind of traditional product divisions and kind of uh, uh, divisions uh, of, of uh, roles, we need to have a very compact team that works very closely together. And that's actually one of the reasons why we kept the company so small and why it was only 12 people until now, um, because we wanted to have a very close team. Uh, and everybody is in Prague until recently. We've just opened the San Francisco office. And so one of the big things that we're trying to do now is to keep the office very, to, to keep the two locations very integrated. Um, so a lot of our developers from Prague travel to San Francisco and work here side by side with us in San Francisco. And uh, once we get up to speed and start hiring uh, employees here in America, they're going to have to be traveling back to Prague and working in Prague as well so that we keep mixing people around so that they keep working side by side and together. And that's, uh, that's a very important part of um, what we're doing. Good. So that was it. Um, I know we still have a lot of time. I think we have about uh, 20 minutes or 30 minutes, something like that. Anybody there? <laughs> yes, we are. 
Yes, yes. Uh, approximately more than 30 minutes, and it's good because this uh, program is mainly about questions. And I believe that you covered very interesting topics. One topic is about your market and what are you really attempting to achieve. But a very interesting topic is also more generally how to build a successful company. And it also starts to a little bit harmonize with our previous speakers who also spoke about the fact that the uh, atmosphere in the company is very important and I have, uh, if I recall you well, you have even said that the uh, product is not that much important as other things. Maybe can you uh, elaborate a little bit more on this? So I have some backup slides. I actually, I expected that nobody is going to have any questions so I have some backup things to talk about while I'm waiting for somebody to come up with a question. And one of them is exactly this. Um, I, I tend to say less that it's not the product that's important. I think product is important, but the idea, the initial idea, what you want to build isn't all that important. And I know that if you talk about innovation, uh, the thing that everybody, including me, would initially typically expect is that you have to come up with a breakthrough idea. And when you come up with a breakthrough idea, that's it, and the rest of it is done. Uh, or it's just annoying bureaucracy and, uh, and, and kind of all the follow-up that follows that. But the important part there is the idea. And uh, people who don't know uh, many things about startup typically tell me that. They tell me, well, you know, what if somebody steals your idea, and, and how do you make sure that nobody copies you? Um, and the answer to that is uh, the, the idea isn't really all that important. It is, it is nice if you have something original that you're trying to do. Uh, there's lots of companies in the world that are very, very successful doing completely common things that many things have done before. But if you have something that's really original, it's going to be original for the next six months or 12 months, and then somebody's going to copy it. And there's almost no way that you can defend against it. Uh, um, canonical example that many people complain about or contest is, 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 is iPhone and, and, and the revolution around smartphones and even such a huge company like Apple is almost impossible to protect against everybody else copying them. Uh, but there's many other examples and we have many competitors too. But what really matters is that once you have an idea um, that, that you put it into practice and that uh, that involves a huge amount of things that you're not good at. Um, because running a company is not just, I mean, I, I'm a programmer. So if I start a company, I, I, I can write a product. I can develop the product. But, um, but there's so many other things that are critical for you to be successful that are nothing about programming. You need to be able to run the business. What is super important is that you need to be able to hire good people. If you don't hire good people, then, then uh, uh, it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to be successful. Uh, you need to talk to your customers, and you need to be able to convince them that they should use your product. Uh, but you should also you also need to be able to listen to your customers and and and, and hear what they want to tell you and, and, and react to that. And you also need to be able to uh, not just listen to them but decide which parts of what they're telling you you should ignore and which you should focus on. It's the, the famous Henry, Henry Ford quote, that if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would tell me they wanted a faster horse uh, and I was building a car. Uh, so there's all of these things that you're not good at. And uh, it's almost impossible early on when you start a small company to, to actually be qualified on all the things that you have to do. Um, you, you cannot have a professional manager that has run many companies and a professional accountant and a professional product manager and a professional uh, salesperson. Uh, that's usually the actual most expensive part. Uh, and all of that on board uh, when you have a very early product and almost no uh, customers. And so by default, early on, you have to be able to do all these things that you're not good at and that you're actually quite an amateur. Um, and you have to be able to somehow decide which one of them are important and which one of them are not, and uh, focus on the on the core things. And that's that's really hard. Uh, and that actually is probably uh, the biggest share of what defines whether the company is successful or not. The idea is is, is a nice part to it. 
Thank you very much. I would like to ask our students, are there any questions? Yes, there, over there. Uh, hi. Uh, when you were in London in the Startup Accelerator, uh, did you stay in touch in, with the other teams? Did they uh, succeed in what they were trying to do? Or did they fall apart? Yeah. That's uh, why they did. Yeah. Uh, great question. Uh, I'll, I'll start by saying that we were not in an accelerator in London. We were in Cambridge. Um, it's now relocated to London. Uh, uh, it's called Techstars London. But I have very fond memories of Cambridge because it was a university city and it was very gorgeous. Really just the university and us and that was it. Uh, but you're right. We were there with a group of uh, ten other start nine other startups, ten altogether. One of them was from New Zealand, one of them was from Estonia, one of them was from Lithuania, we were from Czech Republic. Uh, I think there was somebody from US and France, and there was certainly about three or four that were from UK. And they were selected from several hundred, I think it was like 500 or 800 uh, applications uh, from all around Europe and actually even some international. Um, and uh, out of those 10, I think four or five of them are uh, closed already. And if I'm not mistaken, yeah, f five of them are closed and four of them are because of conflicts in the community. So it's not because the idea was bad. It's not because there was no market for it. It's not because the product is bad. It's none of the other things. It's just because it was a group of people that got together to build something. And then the stress and uh, uh, the constant pressure and the difficult decision making um, have pushed them against each other so much that they they didn't manage the relationship well. And um, so there's two conflicting things uh, that I uh, give advice to people. One of them is you shouldn't start a startup on your own. And that's actually a statistically proven uh, correlation um, out of startups that are tracked um, by several different metrics. The ones that have a single founder have a 10 times less likely success rate. Not one, two times, three times, four times, 10 times, order of magnitude. So it's a big thing. Uh, you can guess why that is. It's, it's, it's not easy to explain it, but, but my take on it is I remember very well each time that my co-founder, we were two co-founders in, in Apiary, and every single time that my co-founder took a vacation, if he went away for one week, I remember it years later. I was going crazy, absolutely crazy. And because the amount of uh, stress and uh, questions and doubts and uh, uh, complications and things that are just coming at you is, is so large that uh, uh, doing it alone is very, very hard mentally. Uh, startup is often like, a, it's, it's very much a roller coaster. It's, it's an up and down. Uh, one day you feel like you're at the top of the world and everybody will bow to you and you will build a global business that will be super successful. And the next day you feel like you will go bankrupt and you will be paying debts off for the rest of your life. And, uh, and it, it, there is very little certainty in, in it, at least in the first couple of years. And so having a single founder is very hard. But at the same time, finding other people to work with you on a startup at all cost, even if you've never worked with them before and you don't know what they are, is also probably a bad idea. And so the four startups that have closed the door because of founder conflicts, several of them have really kind of gotten together because the startup accelerator had a rule and they had a sensible rule. They said, we're not accepting teams that are a single founder. And so if somebody had a good idea, they needed to find some other people to work with in order to apply that. And so some of the teams have joined together because they kind of, it was kind of one of the rules and those fell apart very badly. And some of them were even friends before um, they knew each other. They just never worked with each other before. They were friends from personal life. Um, I have two very close friends uh, in, in UK that were both uh, professional windsurfing instructors. No, actually kitesurfing. Yeah, uh, 
adrenaline sport junkies, kitesurfing instructors, very great guys, um, excellent programmers, uh, got together, um, worked very, very hard, had a great idea, probably actually best idea out of all the startups in the round, out of all the 10 startups, and they fell apart uh, several months after they left the program. I'm very, very fortunate that my co-founder is somebody that I worked with at Good Data before. I actually hired him as the first person into the company that I, that I hired. Uh, and we worked together before that, so we know each other like 15 years. And that's, that's, that's a huge thing because we very much know to rely on each other. Um, so to answer the question, 10 startups, five have closed doors, four of them because uh, founder conflicts, one of them because the market has changed under their feet and they didn't react quickly enough. And that was actually the startup that was furthest along when they joined the accelerator. They already had one million in funding. They came from New Zealand. Um, so they were way, way ahead of anybody else and they were darling of all investors, but they were so far ahead that they were already disrupted by somebody else. And they were doing games and uh, the gaming behavior has changed. People started playing more games on cell phones and on tablets and stopped playing games on desktop computers. And they had a game that was in Flash and Flash doesn't run on tablets very well. And so they ended up closing the shop actually over that. The remaining five out of the 10 uh, are still existing. Most of them are struggling. None of them has managed to uh, grow as much as we did. So none of them has managed to raise uh, the amount of money and uh, uh, expand globally and, um, and uh, get a decent traction. But they're, they're still might. You know, they're, they're still trying. Thank you very much, Jakub. It was a very interesting observation. In fact, in two weeks, we will have founder of Jiva here on this uh, lecture. So you will be also uh, able to find found out what is actually changing in the game industry. But the most important take, off, uh, take out from this is that really the idea is good to have but the realization or implementation is very difficult. And as we already said, you can't implement big things only on your own. And there are even, I would say, two levels, uh, levels of people. One level is the people which you have to have from the beginning and which you probably have to know for longer. And only then you can find other smart people which you will hire or in, in interest in your idea. And very interesting thing is that also, if you look in history, the most successful companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google were founded by fellows, typically by students who, who studied together. So maybe for your next startup, my colleagues, you can look around and maybe several startups will emerge after, after this lesson. Okay. Uh, I and will also, I will add one more, one more thing to it. Um, I completely agree with all of that. I also think that um, it's very valuable if you're able to get um, experience and probably work experience uh, with the close fellows and with the close friends that, that you eventually one day might create a company with. Uh, there is this popular, popular culture notion that most of the startups are founded by uh, young 20-something that have just dropped out of university in order to found a company. And that's the media darlings, and that's the that's the huge success stories. And it's it's definitely true that it's easier to found a company when you're 23 than when you're 33, and it's easier at 33 than when you're 43, probably. Um, uh, you need to sleep less. Uh, you can work more. Uh, you don't have kids. You don't have mortgage. You don't have any other things to um, uh, to detract from your attention. But uh, on the average. Actually, even on, out of the successful startups in the last 10 years, I think the average founder age is something like 37 or 42. Very, very high, actually. Much higher than even I would have expected, and I'm probably quite old when it comes to uh, developers and founders. Uh, but uh, so if you can get work experience, if you want to create your own company now, that's great. If you feel like this is crazy and you don't know if you really want to do it, um, the next best thing to doing your own company is going somewhere where you still feel like you're working on things that make a difference or you're you know, actually trying to, to build something. And you get some work experience there and you find how you can work with other people and you find how um, um, 
who, which type of people you like working with and which type of companies you like working for. And then when you create your own company, you already are very influenced by that. I have to say I'm eternally indebted and have a huge amount of gratitude towards Roman and Good Data and all the people there because I learned tremendously from them. Thank you. So what is very interesting is that basically uh, you will learn by failures. One of the purpose of this course is also to give you some experience of people who already have some failures behind them. But of course, the most, the best school of, of the life is the school of the life. However, the uh, school is not that cheap. So for you, the advice is to start up now, do, to do your startup now and fail once or twice before you get 37 or so, and then you can succeed. But there are also other roads like joining a startup of Jakub and learning here, because basically this is Jakub's uh, way, because Jakub uh, joined startup Apiari before his own one. And I believe, Jakub, that this was also one of your biggest motivation why you eventually founded your own company that you had this atmosphere and something was uh, was appealing to you? Well, uh, not just that I learned the atmosphere, but uh, the problem that we were trying to solve, I wouldn't know about if I didn't work in, in, in good data, essentially. And probably good data was actually directly inspired by the previous company that Roman and some of the people around him did. Um, um, I don't know how many people in the, in the room here are familiar with how difficult it is to analyze corporate data from a company and how difficult it is to figure out the effectivity of your, of your uh, employer employees and how difficult it is to um, you know orient yourself in a company that's got 200 people or 1,000 people or 10,000 people and how difficult it is to steer the company. I didn't. I certainly didn't. And so when good data started, I totally didn't understand uh, why the product was important or necessary. Um, but now that I actually went through building that company and I saw a lot of other companies that we uh, talked to, I, I understand the problem a lot better, how difficult it is to analyze data. In companies. And conversely, what we're doing with Apiary, I, I probably wouldn't have seen the big problem of, uh, of uh, building APIs and building all the associated internal infrastructure in companies. And I wouldn't have known for a fact that not only was it a problem in good data, but it was a problem in every single company that we worked at. And we had many partners in Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, across the world uh, that, that we worked with. And, and I talked to them, and I was very surprised. I was actually responsible directly for APIs in, in good data. And uh, it was infuriating how much time we had to spend on a lot of internal infrastructure. And so I asked a company A, and I said, what are you doing? This is crazy. Like, how are you solving the problem? And they said, yeah, it's crazy. You know, we just spent six months working on uh, internal infrastructure that is really not part of our product and we don't sell it. It's just kind of enabling us to have APIs. And then I talked to another company and they told me the same thing. And, and you know, when I talked to a couple more, I started thinking, well, maybe this is something that would actually be interesting to solve that problem. So um, sometimes you solve problems that you see out there on the street that you see in your everyday life. Uh, but sometimes you solve problems that you only find out by working with in, contra in contexts and uh, in, in uh, work with, which you didn't know before. Thank you. So basically there is no one definite advice of what to do in the life. Maybe the best advice is to follow your heart, do what you want to do and do it with people who you like. And now I would like to give chance to other students. Are there other questions? I will follow up on what you just said. Um, I cannot imagine building this company if I didn't really enjoy what I'm doing because it is so much work um, and work isn't really the, the right word to describe it because um, you might think that you're hardworking and diligent and, and that you, you're not afraid of work, but it's so much stress and uh, so much uncertainty that uh, if if you're doing it for the money, it's probably a bad idea. It's better to go and get employed in a large company and, and, and then you're going to have a stable income and have a life. Um, and the only way to survive this is if you're actually really enjoying it. 
Absolutely. By the way, we have already you as a third speaker, and uh, the uh, ideas are uh, joining as a puzzle, because the very first speaker, uh, Petr Otsasek, told us that uh, if you like your work, you basically never work. And that's the <laughs> yeah. So, Anybody here? If not, I will just ask somebody to, for a question. And you have the bad luck to sit, sitting very close to me. So what would you like to ask? Actually, I don't have any question right now. Bad answer. <laughs> anybody yeah, over there? Good. Hello again. Um, did, did you have any failures or something that you would do in a totally different way when you were building Apiary, or was it all just a success from the beginning? No, absolutely not. There were a huge amount of failures. And um, as you can imagine, we prefer not to talk about them. But <laughs> um, early on, I had a vision for a product that was somehow loosely attached to our core product that we have now. We're, right now we're providing API documentations, API testing, uh, uh, API prototyping, uh, API mockups, uh, several things around owning APIs. But the core customer is somebody who's building an API, a developer who's building an API. And early on I had, a, I had an idea that it would be nice if we were able, if we were able to provide a debugger for people who try to use APIs, and that you could really point to any API out there on the internet, and you could say, "I want to use this API. Please show me all the API calls that I'm sending there, and please give me a kind of line by line debugger of what exactly is happening, uh, kind of like a TCP dump, but on the web." something that's very simple to use for people. I call it the Firebug for APIs, uh, for somebody who knows what Firebug is. And uh, it was a good, good idea, and uh, we developed it. We spent like three months building it, two months building it. And then when we were finished, I looked at it in horror, and I realized that we have a company that is trying to convince the world that it should use product A and it should be used product B and those are completely two different products. And suddenly the difficulty of having one marketing message of, you know, we try to do X became the difficulty of having two marketing messages, we try to do X and Y for uh, A and B, uh, for Alice and Bob, um, for somebody who's building APIs or for somebody who's consuming APIs. And uh, um, so I, decided to scrap it, and we've thrown away three months of work, which now looks like uh, it has three months of work is nothing, but at that point it was probably about a third of the existence of the company, so it was a lot of time that we spent on it, and it was very, very painful. And, uh, and we decided to focus on one thing, and that's actually my motto here, the last uh, motto that I have on the slide, that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Um, I know it sounds funny and uh, uh, it sounds like something uh, that uh, Mr. Zeman would say, it's a bon mot, but uh, there's a lot of to it. It's, it's it, this constant stream of opportunities that don't just look like, oh, it might be a good idea to do this, but they look like it's absolutely essential that we have to do this and it's super important. And uh, deciding which one of those are just nice, and which one of those are good, and which one of those are really stuff that you cannot avoid doing uh, is very hard. And in fact, one of my lessons from good data that I learned uh, from one of the founders was product management is not about what to do next, it's about what, what do we not have to do yet? What can we afford to postpone? Because there's just so much things and so much ideas, uh, and you can only do one out of ten. And, uh, and the, the, the trick is deciding which nine you can not do. Uh, and so, yeah, we spent three months building something that we've never shipped. Uh, we've uh, thrown it away. Um, 
And uh, ironically, a year later, uh, a different company was founded exactly on this product. I don't think they copied us. I don't think they know, knew about it. They just had the same idea a year later. And it's doing pretty well now, and it's growing as a successful company. Um, so I'm not even sure whether I should have killed it at that point. Um, and there's many more. There's, there's, uh, there's plenty of other stories. Uh, I, I, at one point, I had a founder stories talk about uh, all the things that I royally screwed up uh, when I was in Apiary. Um, and it involves all sorts of things like uh, um, ending up on the wrong end of the city when you go to a meeting with investors and uh, making the wrong product decisions and, uh, and um, saying something really wrong when you're talking to a customer. But in the end, the, the positives and the good decisions were um, bigger than the failures that we did. Um, Thank you. I we never that... had something that is a kind of startup, um, uh, frequent startup cliche. Uh, we never had a big pivot. The pivot is uh, something that people, instead of saying, uh, we had a bad idea, let's do something completely different, they say, let's pivot. And it's um, often uh, presented as a, as a mark of agility and the ability to adapt quickly to changing conditions. Sometimes it really just means you had a really bad idea. But um, um, we never had a big pivot. We never said we just completely had a bad idea. Let's do something completely different. I think the original vision that we had is still there. And we're modifying it along the way. And, uh, we're making some um, wrong decisions along the way. But uh, mostly it's working out. Thank you very much, Jakub. I would like to remind also famous quote of Steve Jobs, founder of Apple, who said that he's equally proud to things he didn't do as to things which he did do. And that's about the focus. And uh, now is the time for other question. Yes, just I will give you my microphone. Uh, did you manage to hire the right people from the beginning? Uh, I guess your first uh, employee was the good one, but uh, did you have the same success with all the other employees, or do you have some conflicts with few people they didn't like the company or something like this? So it's another great question. This is a public video. Would you expect me to say that I hired somebody wrong who was at the company? <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, um, I was extremely lucky with the first person that I hired into APR. He was Lukash, and now my CTO, and uh, is leading the whole development team. And I think I, I have never done uh, a hire this good before or after. Um, it was probably luck more than anything. But uh, also at the same time, there's a lot of what we talked about was culture that was very important. Um, and in fact, still up to this day, the way that I'm hiring into Apiary is not uh, you know, send me your CV, uh, tell me your experience, uh, here's this example code, uh, please develop an example application. We're doing none of that. Um, and the way that I'm hiring people is I, I take them out for lunch. And I just listen to them and I talk to them. And I found out if I like them, uh, which isn't really, it's less about whether they're attractive or whether I agree with their opinions. And it's more about um, the way they think and uh, what they like. And uh, a big part of what I'm looking for and a big part of uh, uh, what I'm trying to find is people that are honestly excited and passionate about what they would be doing. We've got many different things in APR that we're doing. So there's specialization different people can work on different things. Um, so it's not like we all have to like the same thing. Uh, but I'm almost trying to protect the person that's joining us, uh, trying to think on their behalf whether they're going to be happy when they're in APR. And if they're going to be happy doing what I want them to be doing, then the rest of it is really um, secondary. Uh, if they're passionate and excited, then that is the most important thing. So I, 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 I like asking people what they like and what they like about programming. If they, if they want to be developers, why do they want to be developers and what they like about it? 
it's very interesting to look for the answers, to, to, to look for people answers. Sometimes you very quickly identify when somebody's trying to bullshit you when they say, I like analyzing hard problems, or I like debugging code, you know, and uh, I like observing computational complexity, and uh, that's usually not the case. <laughs> and I'm really trying to find uh, what is it that you like about programming that keeps you up at 2 a.m. and you cannot go to sleep because you have this idea and, and you have to finish it and, and you haven't done it yet. Um, and um, if, 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 if you have that, then, then you're probably going to be very good. Thank you very much. It's again about uh, motivation and about willingness to do the work, which is in fact not the work, as you rightly said. Uh, any other questions? We have still time for, I believe, two questions. I would also like to say that uh, all your thoughts are very much uh, similar to, to also my understanding and what we, we have also had here. So, for example, we have some two parts of our brain. One is the rational one, this is the newer one, and one is the emotional one, which really motivates us for action. And if we are not motivated, we are not as, as capable. It's not only about the technical skills and about the knowledge. Yeah. So, please, don't hesitate. You are sitting here. So, uh, what were the most inter interesting opportunities you had to miss because uh, you had to concentrate on the main thing? <laughs> well, that's the, that's the trick of it, that you never really know what you missed. I mean, there's lots of things that look like a good idea. I'll, I'll give you just a couple examples. Uh, I gave you an example on product features. Um, that's, that's, that's always very big. Uh, I, I and my team are very product focused. So we literally love building things. I, sometimes I think of it as, it, it's like a carpenter, you know, it's, it's, it's a craft. Like there's nothing and then you work and, and you create something out of nothing. It's very exciting. I, I really honestly like that. It's, it, it's just like it, with your own hands, although you're just you know, tapping on the keyboard, but with your own hands, you build something out of nothing. And um, so we are guilty of um, thinking too much about product and not enough about everything else, like marketing and sales and business plans and revenue and all. Of that. We love building products. And so initially, um, the, the big things that, that were very hard to keep at, keep at bay were we should do this, oh, and we should also do that, and we should also do this, and it would be really nice to have that, and it's absolutely important that we have this. And, um, and yeah, you have to decide nine out of ten you have to cut, and probably actually um, if, yeah, if, you, if you want to focus really, you have to pick one thing at a time. So literally, you know, I have to say this is the one thing that I'm going to be doing, and I'm likely going to be doing it for the next two weeks or, or a month or two months, and that means that everything else has to be secondary, has to has to wait until I'm finished. And um, yeah, so there's many things that we've that we really would have liked to have built and have never built them because we just didn't have time for them, and we decided they weren't important enough, although they would be really really nice and really great. Um, the other things that are constantly distracting you are, are somebody is constantly inviting you to conferences. And that's one of the things that's really nice to do, right? You go to conferences, people pat you on the back, you get up on the stage and you tell people uh, what a great thing you're doing and everybody tells you that's really great that you're doing a great thing. Um, and so it makes you feel good, uh, but it doesn't necessarily help the company. Sometimes it does, but you have to decide uh, which conferences are worth, uh, if it's worth spending time. And uh, I see many startups going to all these social occasions, not just in Prague, but also, you know, here in Silicon Valley, everybody likes to go to South by Southwest. And I, if I count the number of people that have told me, oh, you have to go to South by Southwest, it's such a great conference and so much networking going on. And you will meet so many great people and you will promote your product so badly. And it's hard to say, no, I don't have the time. You know, it's, it takes four days and I don't have the time for four days. I have to be sitting here and working. Um, the other things that <laughs> keep distracting you is filing taxes and doing accounting. You know, <laughs> For the first, uh, first year, we were pretty bad with accounting and we're paying the price now, 
but uh, it was probably good that we didn't do it at that point because if we were better at doing our accounting, maybe we weren't so good at doing our product. Uh, or maybe I'm just apologizing. But um, yeah, um, you don't know what opportunities you missed because you haven't taken different roads. Uh, you only know that the things that you've picked, whether they were the right picks or not. But as I told you, uh, we spent three months doing something that we threw away afterwards. So sometimes I haven't picked the right things. Thank you very much. And is there any other last question from the auditorium? If not, I would like to have my last question. Jakub, where would you like to be in five years now? So, you know, you are on the road and you are some uh, willing to have some achievements. So, what would be the situation when you say, I am satisfied? Those are two questions. Where am I going to be in five years and uh, when am I going to be satisfied? <laughs> <laughs> they are not necessarily the same. In five years, I'd like to be back in Prague. Uh, I have a small boy, he's two years old. I'd like him to go to a Czech school uh, as opposed to American school, um, which really means that in five years, uh, this, pro this company is either large enough that it doesn't need me in the US anymore, or it's sold. And um, probably the second one is more likely. Um, and what happens after that is very, very much an open question. Um, if I sell this company, um, I'll take some time off to think about what to do next. Um, but I'm afraid that I will not be happy not doing anything. So there's that bug of, oh, wouldn't it be nice to start another company and uh, and, uh, and do all the crazy things again. So uh, the search for eternal happiness is something quite different than uh, how to close the company and exit it and how to sell it and um, how to run the business. Thank you very much. It was very insightful and I believe that our students benefited very much from having you here and uh, I would like to wish you all the best to your company and also the happiness for the personal life. However, these things are sometimes not compatible but this is the life about. about. So, Thank you very much, Jakub. It was our great pleasure to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I can also wish to all the students that are there that I will wish you that you run companies. I will wish you that you are working on things that you love doing because I think that's the most important thing. Good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Next time we will have future analytics here. And I would like to. Uh, wish you that